दुनिया है आबाद यहाँ लगते हैं लोग मुझको परिवार की तरह द एलुमनाई ऑफ एच एन एल यू हैव ऑलवेज बीन रेडी एंड विलिंग टू एक्सटेंड देयर हैंड टू सपोर्ट आर स्टूडेंट्स इन एवरी पॉसिबल वे एंड दे हैव रेज द नेम ऑफ द यूनिवर्सिटी टू द स्काईज एंड बियॉन्ड बाय एक्सेलिंग इन वॉट दे डू वी हैव विद अस टूडे वन सच स्टार एंड एलुमनाई मिस गुनीत कौर मैम इज फ्रॉम द टू बैच ऑफ एच she pursued her llm from the university of california she has worked as a legal and research fellow at jagdalpur legal aid group and is presently engaged at gnr legal new delhi it is her commendable achievement that she was listed in the forbes india 30 under 30 list in the year 2015 a list of 30 most influential people under the age of 30 from all over india from different fields having an impact on the society ms gunith kaur has very rightly earned herself the title of the equity defender for her interest in areas of human rights legal aid transitional justice among others the laws and judicial systems are made by humans and for the humans and yet even in the 21st century we see basic human rights violations and hence we see, we need more defenders of equity like our guest speaker today some hopefully coming up from the batch of 2021 ma'am it is an honor to have you here and we are looking forward to an enriching session with you i would now request our honorable vice chancellor professor dr v c vivekanandan sir to share a few words over to you sir thank you thank you mr naran and it's my pleasure to welcome ms gunith kaur to this program we are quite happy in this last uh, few days that a lot of alumni are connecting back to the the what i call the most fresh grad would be graduates joining this year by sharing their experiences by giving insights and motivation that way i'm quite happy to welcome her on behalf of you know chennai as the head of this institute i said that uh, if you really look at it uh, the subject what she is going to speak and what she has been practicing is something which is always considered court and court not a paying area in uh, law school or anywhere they say that that is basically a bit of a moral area to claim to be a little bit of human rights but uh, not to lose track of other things but the point is i'm not going to comment how people view at human rights but we are at least happy we are living in this time of the century where this discourse is there if you really look back the discourse was never there it was basically a evolutionary process i call it if you believe in evolution when might was right was what ran everything and the might was right was slowly tinkered and slowly 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 very very slowly many many thinkers philosophers fought it is like moving few inches but you slide back that has been the important part of human rights if you really look and any commentator i read many many articles in the recent times even popular regimes when you look around the world including democracies like india and many places where it is considered that human rights you know or not the main part of the discourse we are talking about a kind of a mythical development a mythical you know who is number one who is in the hierarchy or who is smarter and this seems to be the discourse underlying things it is not just from leaders i am telling leaders are popularly getting elected by people which means something is going you know something drastically problematic below and that could be the reason because they are not they are these people are not as sure as power like anything they have come from you know everybody single vote of the people so in such case the worry some for anybody of uh, my generation people when we studied there are a lot of these issues which came to the fore even then at that time it was you know 
it's a small minority who will talk about this. I remember in my college days, big movements came on Union Carbide issue. A lot of college people got first time to come to know from science. I was a science student. Looking about Union Carbide, I thought some gas leaked and people died. That's all we knew. And then the whole discourse, what the other side of art students are talking in my college, we couldn't understand. Then we understood, then we really thought that we are in a very cocoon world without knowing what's happening. And that some of the one of the trigger points for me to move from science to, you know, arts and law. But what I'm telling it is then you thought it's it's progressing. Then suddenly you'll find it is, you know, when I say regressing in terms of its understanding, in terms of people who want to, you know, fight for it, in terms of people who want to believe in it. And so in that case, it's very, very gratifying that uh, you find uh, one of the HNLU graduate, you know, who has taken this not just as uh, afterthought, but it looks like from our studies itself, she has been very clearly wanting to do this, etc. So it is it is a very evolutionary process. As I read, I'm not recollecting the name of this poet who said the world, all this world, he put this history into three G's. He said the first G was on the name of God. They all fought. The second G, he said, was the name of gold. They fought, empires were. There. Third was glory. He referred to the Cold War era. It's ideologies. It is God and gold was not intellectually. Glory became the third important part. And he said these three G's miserably has failed the world because he said 50% of the people, 50% of the people fought. That is called men. And the 50%, he said, were silent, mute spectators or cheerleaders of the fight. So he said the emancipation is only in the fourth G he called gender. The old world, if you want an emancipation, it could only come from the fourth G called as gender. This I read, I'm telling you, frankly, 20 years back. Right? I really don't know. After 20 years back, it's a very powerful statement I read. And that also made me to look at more closely about gender justice, all that. But as we said that, it's a long way again. It's a long way in, in uh, you know, what you call as the, 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 it is not to segregate genders. But the whole question is, one seems to be running the world and in a particular, you know, passionate way of whatever way of, you know, fight or whatever. Another one seems to be not even participating. That's a fact. If you really look at very many statistics, even in open societies or even to an extent in developed countries. So it's a very complex situation and it's very easy to close your eyes. And then, you know, uh, tell that uh, we are not uh, what I call as uh, uh, what can I do? I didn't do anything bad and why should I be get involved? But I only remember uh, my one of my favorite authors is Fyodor Dostoevsky. In his brother's Karmazov, he makes a statement. Everyone is really responsible for all men. Everyone is really responsible for all men, for all men and for everything, of course. Even even I would say that Dostoevsky is not including women in that or by as normal usage is telling all men responsible for all men for everything. And in my opinion, if I really look at that statement at that point, I thought it's about human rights, same thing. So it's not a specialized area. It's not a profession. It's not a career, but human rights is something as we are born as human and we are now expanded to animal rights is expanded to many other rights around us, or rather we are part and parcel of everything. It is simply human rights is something what we breathe and what we are conscious and subconscious. So in that, I'm quite happy to uh, have Ms. Gaur coming today to address the students. As I said that uh, uh, this is a starting point and I'm pretty sure that she will be, you know, uh, uh, you know, connecting with the university and, you know, coming here to lecture as well as you know, uh, talk to the students well. I, I don't know. They said she passed out in 2008, and I'm probably pretty sure, Professor, the one familiar figure in our university now is a person, Professor Uday Shankar, who must have been always involved with, you know, students of the earlier batches. He's also joined as a registrar. I hope he's connected today in the program. So this is my words. I can see him on the screen, right? Okay. 
uh, and you know, I, I means you know, I, I close my opening remark. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. We would like Ms. Guneet Kaur, our guest speaker for the day, to take the charge and let the first years and the LLM students and all of us waiting for this enriching session to start. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, uh, Professor Arindam. Thank you, Professor Dr. Vice, Vice Chancellor VC Vivekananda, sir. Uh, for that lovely, very powerful, uh, actually, introduction to my uh, lecture. And I think, I hope I will be touching a lot of themes, uh, at least I have at the back of my head that you spoke about. Uh, thank you to my first law teacher, uh, the registrar, Professor Dr. Uday Shankar, sir. Uh, a lot of my base of how I look at law is due to that first legal method class that he took and what I learned from him. Um, and thank you to uh, Professor Dr. Avasti, Professor Dr. Yogendra Shivasta, Masuma, as well as other faculty members and student representatives who are organizing this lecture series. Um, it's always a blessing, a joy, an honor to sort of give back to the HNLU community in whatever way or form. Um, so I am really grateful for this opportunity. Um, I also take a moment to welcome all the first year students from the undergraduate BALLB batches and uh, the PG, the postgraduate LLM batches to the HNLU community. Um, I hope the times that we are in slightly surreal, slightly quite dark of work from home, study from home, uh, get over soon and you get the full HNLU experience because uh, it is really a very, very beautiful campus. Um, and uh, it has, uh, you know, that the learnings, not just in the classroom, but more importantly, outside the classroom have shaped me as a person that I am today, whether it's on an interpersonal level, definitely on a professional level and also on a political level. So I really hope that you soon get to have that full HNLU experience. Uh, before I proceed further, I do want to check uh, if everybody is okay with English or do you want me to do simultaneous translation in English and Hindi, which I'm very happy to do uh, because I do understand that, uh, you know, English is not the first language for many people. It is a language which is restricted to an elite minority. Um, and that's okay, uh, but I am doing a lecture on equity, and I think it will be quite inequitable uh, if I do it in a long in a language format, which is, uh, you know, for basically an elite minority. So, agar kisi ko chahiye ki main Hindi aur English dono mein baat karu, to main bahut khush hu wo translation simultaneously karne ke liye, kyunki mujhe lagta hai ki main equity pe baat kar rahi hu. So morally or logically, it will be wrong if I talk in such a language that a lot of people say that because all of modern school, all of the convent school, uh, or all of the English uh, education has not got uh, English medium education. So if you have a little bit of discomfort, you can write in the chat box mein likh sakte and I'm, main bahut khush hu usko, uh, dono usme, uh, translate both of them to translate. And while I uh, give you two minutes to take that decision, I do want to reflect on an anecdote uh, from uh, actually on language itself of something that I witnessed in the Supreme Court a couple of years ago when I was still practicing there. Um, there was uh, the national entrance exam meet for medical students um, and uh, it was all happening in a lot of hurry. They, you know, they suddenly imposed the national the exam within three months notice period. So a lot of states were opposing it because before that you had states having their own exam, you had private colleges having their own exam. And uh, so there was a lot of chaos and obviously, uh, and the only language in which the test could be taken was English and Hindi. Uh, whereas when you had state exams, they also had their state languages. Um, and one of the judges on the bench said that, well, if they're intelligent, they'll know English. And uh, the lawyer who was a senior advocate who was representing the state of Maharashtra, he retorted, he said, your lordship, uh, we are not just making doctors to go serve in escorts in Medanta. We need doctors to go serve at the primary health center in a remote corner of Maharashtra as well. And if he doesn't, if he's not able to communicate to a person who only speaks Marathi, if he's not able to understand what that person is saying, 
then what are we really building doctors for? Like, then what's the really need? Because the, uh, the language itself, and this is something I realized really late in law school, that command over English doesn't really have anything to do with your ability to have, you know, to understand legal, uh, the nuance of law, to understand logical reasoning. Uh, it has very little, it is literally just a language. And I hope that, uh, you know, this, uh, this little reflection, uh, do, because of this little reflection, all of you will make space because not everybody will have the same command. Uh, even your faculty members may not have the same command, may not have the same pronunciation that you grew up with, may not have the same accent that you grew up with. So make space for your classmates, for your faculty members who may not have the same, uh, you know, perspective towards English and don't look down or don't uh, troll them uh, just because they speak in a different way than you do. And don't judge them on their ability, on their intelligent ab on ability to legally reason or understand the nuances of law. Um, seeing as nobody has typed in the chat box, so I will continue my lecture in English. Uh, a little bit of introduction about myself. Actually, uh, I think uh, Arindan sir went to my uh, LinkedIn profile, which hasn't been updated in half a decade. Uh, I graduated from HNLU in 2013, and I did go to the University of California, Berkeley after that for my master's. Um, I have since then worked in mostly conflict spaces. Uh, I also litigated in uh, Punjab, in courts in Punjab and Delhi. And then after that, I was working with an international uh, organization called Accountability Council as their Asia consultant. Um, as of next month, as of around this time next month, I will be starting my doctoral research in Berlin. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, the structure of my lecture, I will talk a little bit about why I do what I do, uh, which kind of, uh, you know, sir said that I, you know, I had chosen those subjects even through my education in law school. So I will explain a little of why I, it got me there, how I do the work that I do, uh, what I learned through this relationship, this 14 year relationship with law, uh, you know, interacting with law, where I feel that legal education or legal analysis can have a different perspective. Um, and what are the challenges that you do overcome in this, uh, you know, you face in this space and how do you, what are the tools you'd use to overcome those challenges? So I grew up uh, at a time I was born at literally the end of the conflict in Punjab when it was at its peak. So I kind of grew up in a post conflict Punjab with uh, a lot of oral history of uh, disappearances of young men, of police killings. Some of them we would even, you know, we would even know that okay, our bus is taking a different route because the police has killed a young man and there is a, there is a protest going on. Um, and uh, of course, because my mother came from outside of Punjab, she had her narratives of what happened uh, in 1984 across the country. And uh, the growing up years were very. Uh, it was. It was a little bit of a paradox, uh, you know, a distortion because my family is telling me that all of this has happened, but my textbooks are not discussing that. The official media narrative is not discussing that. So there was this like, what is really the truth? Where does really the truth lie? And uh, when I was in 2002, we had the program in Gujarat. And that was kind of playing on our TV screens because that was the first time television media was really booming in terms of cable TV television. And that was the first time that I understood what my parents were talking about 84, that the state can sometimes be very much party to violence against its own citizens because the state is formed by people and people are infallible and people are biased and people can nurture hate. And, uh, and then, at the age of 18, I came to HNLU and uh, and that was also a very interesting time to be in Chhattisgarh, be in Raipur, because this was again now the peak or the end of the Salva Judum regime in South Chhattisgarh or Bastar, as some of you have heard. Uh, Salva Judum was essentially a method in which large sections of Adivasi communities, villages of Adivasi communities were told, hey, there is a camp set up kilometers away from your village. Uh, you either leave your village and come to that camp and live there forever, leave your lands, leave everything behind and live there. And we and, you know, we will 
be basically surveilling everything you do inside out. There will be force there. Or we will just burn your village and, you know, and tons of atrocities as documented in the Supreme Court case of Nandini Sundar went down, including rapes, including brutal killings. Many people uh, had to escape to Andhra. And I realized that there was no conversation happening in the law school about it. We were in the same state. We were, I mean, forget what is right, what is wrong, but we were not even discussing all this violence. And there is this huge case going on in the Supreme Court. And mind it, I graduated in 2013. So the judgment that declared it unconstitutional came in around 2012, but no discussion. And so it was again a repetition of the same pattern that I had seen in my childhood, that there is no conversation, and this is a law school, that there is no conversation that we are doing. Uh, about the wrong that was really literally happening next door. Um, and because of, and I was curious because, I mean, I was curious because I had all the childhood narrative to take with me. So I kind of really wanted to understand that. And I got, and I reached out to a few people and I connected with uh, the Chhattisgarh chapter of People's Union for Civil Liberties. Um, and I met some wonderful people. And there was this one amazing female lawyer who uh, used to practice in the Bilaspur High Court. And she said something wonderful. She, uh, I asked her about, you know, this dichotomy, this gap in narratives, because conflicts do produce conflicted narratives. And she said something which continues to kind of guide me till date. She said, if you're on a narrow road, let's say, and you're walking, and there is a person in a car who comes on that narrow road, for the person on the car, you are the nuisance. For him, for you, that person can really endanger your life. So that person is the nuisance. Your perspective sort of change based on where you are. And that really is, uh, you know, in a lot many ways, law, the courts, the justice delivery system is that narrow pathways. We, when we come to law school, we are told that the law is neutral. We are told, you know, we wear black and white. We are told it's all black and white. We are told that, you know, it's rule of law. We are told that the justice is blind. But it really isn't. It doesn't work in a power vacuum. It very the making of law, the reading of law, the analysis of law, the interpretation of law, and the study of law. It happens very much in structures of power. And I I do believe, and I mean, I know that a lot of people will disagree with me in the academic community, but I think I do believe that you need to understand where that power lies. And my work essentially, I'm a I I call myself a movement lawyer because I use, I don't use law as the primary method. What I do is that I use law, uh, I use advocacy, I use human rights research, I use documentation, as well as court legal strategies to kind of build uh, strategies for uh, moving towards the objective of accountability and remedy, accountability for wrongs that have been committed. Um, and remedying those who against whom wrongs have been committed, because that was really the question that growing up in Punjab happened, that all of these people have been disappeared, lakhs of young men have been disappeared, but where is the remedy? Where is the answer? Who is getting prosecuted for it? So that question really began my journey towards law, and it kind of became bigger in, uh, in when I started interacting on issues of Bastar. Um, and one case that I specifically remember is uh, it happened right before I passed out in 2012 uh, was there is a little village in uh, Bijapur in South Chhattisgarh, which is called Sarkiguda. Um, and the Adivasi communities, there were three different villages. Adivasi, they were gathered at the central ground in the middle of those three villages and they were having a, a meeting. So they have something called uh, a meeting where they decide where to plant, who plants which seed. They're very community-led. Uh, the, the decision making is very community level in Adivasi communities. So who will plant seeds where that was the discussion. The festival is called Beach Condom. And uh, the next day we hear the home minister in Delhi, the chief minister in the state, congratulating the CRPF forces because they have killed some 14 or 15 dreaded Naxalites. Um, and then a brave journalist uh, managed to go there and he realized these are not Naxalites. These are ordinary villagers. Some of them are kids as young as 13 and 14, and they have been killed from very close range. This is a planned attack on them. 
and the state is celebrating that attack. There is this whole, like, really a difference in the narrative. And when I started working, I went, uh, I worked with the Jagdalpur Legal Aid Group, as Sir mentioned. So when I started working, um, I ended up assisting the communities at Sarke Goda. And that really is how uh, I do my work, which is that you center the community and you center their needs. And then you decide strategies accordingly, which may not necessarily be always legal strategies. They may require protests, they may require advocacy, they may require commissions. And because of all the work that the community had done, there was a commission of inquiry. And that commission of inquiry about two years ago finally came to a decision and uh, and they said these were not Naxalites, these were ordinary Adivasis. They were innocents who were killed. It was a retired judge who wrote that report. Uh, but what happened to them? Was every, anybody ever put in jail for killing them? Uh, was there any FIR? No, there was nothing. So it is from this that I started looking at questions of accountability and remedy. That where is the rupture and and where does it go again and again? And my mentor, the person who told me about the narrow car, you know, about the narrow road and car, um, her name is Sudha Bharadwaj. She is one of the uh, 15 people who are falsely, 15 human rights defenders who are today falsely implicated in a case with, where the trial hasn't even started for the last three years. Uh, and commenting on her incarceration and of those others, noted political scientist Pratap Bhanu Mehta said that democratic barbarianism is being sustained by judicial barbarianism. And I kind of wanted to understand that where does the judicial barbarianism come from? Because that it's not new. It is happening again and again and again. I saw it with my community in Punjab. I went to Mizoram and somebody's talking about the fact that they were carpet bombed. Where is the accountability for that carpet bombing? Where is the state accountability that, yes, we wronged the section of people? Uh, where are the reparations? Uh, we, uh, we all know about many wrongs that go happen in Kashmir. I spoke about Bastar. Uh, there, are, there are cases about extrajudicial killings from Manipur that are still pending in the Supreme Court. And then we also hear about uh, various pro pogroms against, you know, every few years we have a pogrom. Uh, we had last year, two years, last year, year and a half ago, we had the pogrom in Delhi uh, in February. We had the 2000 anti-Muslim anti pogrom. We had the 1984 anti-Sikh pogrom. We had anti-Christian pogrom in Kandamal. So you do have mass violence. You have state participating in that mass violence. And yet there is no conversation about how do you hold the state accountable? And how do you remedy the wrong that you're doing with population after population? Um, and it's not, and, and see, law is, uh, the whole purpose of law is to regulate relationships, is to uh, ensure that we have peaceful existence. So law regulates those relationships, it sets up rules for those peaceful existence. But what if the law is structured in such a way that it is itself, uh, you know, it is building steps for oppression rather than a peaceful existence. That it is uh, allowing you to, uh, you know, it is allowing you to look the other way because it's just because it's legal. Uh, I would like to quote actually a decision which is highly critiqued and then was thankfully overturned was the Suresh Kaushal decision on uh, LGBTIQ rights. And in the Suresh Kaushal decision where they, you know, again, criminalize uh, gay sex, homosexual sex, is, what they say is it's a minuscule minority and, this, and the councils have not produced enough evidence of state discrimination against them. So the court thought it is okay to look away because it's a minuscule minority. In, in our law school, we thought it was easy to look away about what was happening in Bastar because it is not something that concerns us. In the rest of the country thought it is okay to look away with what has happened in Punjab all these years uh, because it doesn't concern us. And where does that go back to? And if I look at it, I, I mean, I'm also somewhere looking at my personal journey and everything. And I'm, I'm a grandchild of partition or wand as we call it in Punjabi. Uh, all four of my grandparents migrated from different parts of what is now Pakistan. 
Um, most of, uh, one of them passed away before I could like, you know, really sit and discuss. Uh, one was too young to remember anything. One of my grandfathers doesn't want to discuss at all. And then uh, my maternal grandfather only recently opened up about the, uh, you know, about what he saw. And uh, because I gave him a book and, uh, you know, and then he finally started talking and he's like 80 years old now. Um, and he said that, you know, I, he spoke about the loss of his grandfather during the move. He spoke about the loss of his aunts. He spoke about the confusion once they reached there, the moving from acquaintance to acquaintance house, searching for their brother. He spoke about seeing violence against Muslims in when they once they reached here. Uh, he particularly remembers this sibling pair who jumped into a wall right in front of his eyes because a mob was chasing them. Um, and he said the most important thing, like, but the one thing that I remember the most is my father's face because he couldn't decide whether to leave or whether to, you know, whether to leave everything behind and go or whether to stay there. He was, he just couldn't take that decision. And I remember his face of anxiety and he's, my grandfather is a 12 year old boy at that point of time or something. So my grandfather is saying that, uh, like, what does that do? Psychiatrists say that something like that will cause you trauma. He hasn't talked about it all these years. So psychiatrists say that that will cause you trauma. And they also say that that trauma passes from generation to generation, intergenerational trauma. And that kind of does explain why, you know, sometimes now I understand why my mother would go quiet every mid-August when what Nehru would call was a tryst, a midnight tryst with destiny. For my mother, I, I spoke to her recently and she said, well, my parents were going through a lot and this is not a moment of celebration for me. And, and then I looked at the constitution making. I, so how did that violence impact the constitution making process? How did that impact, you know, what did we learn from that violence? So I went through the constant assembly debates and I realized that there is a lot of conversation of the partition and the violence, but all that conversation has come from a place of fear and has been used to carry forward colonial forms of repression, colonial tools of repression, colonial, colonial laws of repression, the Brit like or colonization, into the independent India. In fact, we are the we're probably one of the only constitutional democracies that has the exception to the rule of law and exception to the fundamental rights within the fundamental rights chapter itself. And the justification for all of that is the partition. But there is no conversation about there are very little conversation about how do you hold people accountable who were behind that violence or who would do such violence in future. How do you remedy the wrong of those who witnessed that violence, who lost everything in that violence, or if something like that happens in future? How do you fix? Because these are lakhs and lakhs of people. So it's a society that is traumatized. How do you fix that trauma? How do you heal that? And we made a journey. We started like, you know, a law was structured was from that journey without really acknowledging the trauma that we had just witnessed. We shipped it under the carpet because it was uncomfortable because that's how humans function. And I think that it's time to change that. It's time to understand, uh, yes, violence is uncomfortable, but it is happening again and it's coming closer and closer to the center. So it is important to acknowledge that violence. It is also important I think in the study of law to understand your own power. Going to law school itself, receiving legal education in a premier law school like this is in itself a privilege, is in itself a power that you have. And Sir said that, you know, human rights is a, a different field. I don't think human rights is a different field. Human rights is in a sense, and I mean, Sir then also spoke about how it is essential to being human. And I think that it's essential to being a lawyer. If you are a corporate lawyer in a corporate law firm and you're doing a due diligence and you know, you have all these environmental norms that you have to look at. Uh, yes, law school teaches you to do, you know, I mean, law school doesn't teach you. I think law practice teaches you that you go all the way for your client. You do everything for your client. 
but that also means that if you're going to look over certain, you know, you're going to round up the law, you're going to look over certain due diligence norms, you're going to look over environmental norms, it will have its cost on someone later. So be to be mindful of that, even in your corporate law practice, uh, in a competition law practice, the fact that you will help a company monopolize is going to have a cost on the consumer, is going to have a cost on the workers who work, is going to have a cost on the laborers who work for them if they have complete monopoly over the sector. So it is important to understand, I think morally, but also as somebody who has the privilege of having a relationship with law, to inculcate that sense of what is the cost of, you know, what you're doing or, or, or of that power of law on another person. And I think that that is also important in the study of law. How, what is the, you know, we, before we come, our CLAT exam is normally, I don't know if it still happens that way. It will be like John did this, Peter did this. Uh, and, you know, so this is the reasoning. This is the logic applied to it. And then in law school also, we learn in similar ways that this is the law. This is the fact. This is the analysis. The law is not that black and white. It really does work. You know, it's not just John and Peter. John may be a white man, Peter may be a black man in a very racialized America, and their power structures may be very different. Uh, you know, in, in our country, I mean, if you look at rates of the criminal justice system, uh, when it comes to six, six, they are, the representation in the criminal justice in incarceration is double of their percentage share in the population. When it comes to Muslims, it's almost it's more than half. When it comes to Dalits, it's more than half. Why is it that uh, when it comes to Adivasis again, it's more than half? And in a lot of my cases, I saw because I work with special laws, laws again, which are exception to the Constitution, because for certain communities, we allow the Constitution to create that exception. And when I saw those, uh, you know, when I see those figures, a lot of it are people who are serving pre-trial incarceration. They, it hasn't been proved whether they've actually done the crime or they haven't done the crime. They are serving years and years in jail without a trial. And then the trial happens and there is no evidence and they get acquitted. In Buster, the statistics were as high as 98% of the incarcerated getting acquitted. And they're spending four or five years in jail. And why I say it is a privilege to really know the law was from this experience in Buster that I worked with one of my clients in Buster who was a woman who was 24 at that point of time, the same age as me. And she was 18 when she was picked up. She was going to a village fair with her sister. She was picked up uh, and she was brutally sexually assaulted in police custody. Um, and uh, and because of that sexual assault, her physical health was not well for four or five years. Her mental health was not well for four or five years. And she and she kept going, you know, she the case kept going, the case kept going. It was stuck for years on basis of one witness. And I remember finally when she was acquitted, we asked the judge, Kya order litto. And the judge said, Ki itne saal to jail mein ek saal, thodi der aur relegi. Kya farak because that is the level of dehumanization we are reducing certain communities to. And that it doesn't build a bubble around us because if the law is not doing its function, then the society has fundamentally broken. Then it is going to affect us too. Um, I don't remember that exact share, but I think it's a Rahat Indori share. So just because a section is from a privileged community, just because it doesn't mean that a, a conflict breaking up will not affect them. And I think that learning of law, that inculcation or into learning of law is very important. In terms of further, of my, in terms of going ahead with my journey, I think that I, you know, after HNLU, I went to Berkeley where uh, I did have access to a little more. And, and I do think that some ways actually things have changed that ways. I didn't have access to a, a constitutional rights society, a constitutional law society or an ADSC where I can have those discussions. So it's really amazing that you have those, uh, you know, you have those groups where you can have these discussions, where you can look and reflect on your own privilege. You can make space for your classmates who may not be from the same background. 
uh, we didn't have that. Uh, when I went to Berkeley, I had a little bit more opportunity. I got a chance to work with legal aid clinics. I got a chance to volunteer with a refugee clinic. I got a chance to be part of the National Law uh, Legal Guild, which is like a lawyers guild, which is a uh, an all U.S. movement for lawyers who are radical. Um, and it was very, uh, and it was an interesting thing. And I hope we can do some of those, especially the clinic part. Uh, if we can do some of those in HNLU itself, because uh, we do have the resources for it, I think, uh, and we do have the guidance for it. Uh, and I, I, and this is the, and I do believe that this is some, some certainly a little bit of a problem with the five-year education model that. We really come at law school very young without really, you know, we, we literally get out of our colleges, uh, out of our schools and come. So we are coming out of our bubbles and we are coming here. Uh, so our understanding of society is very, you know, limited, very restricted. Uh, and I realized this in Berkeley when I was studying because there was an undergraduate student with whom I was doing a refugee case and I didn't have the skills to know how to interact with the client who had gone through so much trauma. You know, she was a sexual assault kind who had escaped from our country with a lot of difficulty, was scared she's not going to get asylum. And whereas on, the person on the other hand had done her bachelor's, she'd worked for some years with an NGO. So she had like really good skills. So that is also very important. The people skill is also very important in the learning of law. How do you treat your fellow citizens? If you're going to become a judge, it is very important to understand, to have the empathy to look at people as you know, to look, understand the trauma of those coming from Dalit communities, understand the trauma of those coming from Adivasi communities, rather than really looking at them as, oh, and I think that in fact, the reservation, uh, when we talk about reservation, that was one thing where the constitution assembly debates, thanks to the vision of Baba Sahib Ambedkar, does talk about a reparative model that there are, years and years of wrong and thousands of years of oppression and marginalization that has happened. How do we remedy? How do we reparate that wrong? And reservation came out of that thought for reparation. And I think we need to be mindful because our privilege today comes from the fact that somewhere we have, you know, there is an ancestral model of oppression that our ancestors were party to. So uh, I, I do think that you know you 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 have to inculcate that learning. You have to inculcate that kindness uh, into law, and uh, I think that you know the whole culture of I I was a very avid mooter and I loved it and I enjoyed it. Uh, and you know we won a lot of stuff also, and it was always fun to travel and all of that. But I uh, but I do think that both the study and the practice of law is highly competitive. And what it does in that highly competitive space is that it dehumanizes you in a certain way that it's okay to kind of, you know, do everything at any cost possible to uh, that, you know, the that law is itself dehumanized. But I do think that the practice of law at the core of it needs to have uh, kindness and humility to it. You cannot practice the law. You cannot learn the law. Uh, you cannot use it as a tool for change, as a tool to make a difference. If you don't have the humility to sit and listen to your client, if you don't have the humility to make space for your classmates who may not be as privileged as you, uh, if you do not have the humility to uh, know your own privilege. Uh, and it also requires a lot of kindness to make space for traumas of people. Uh, and. So moving on, I think when I went to uh, so in Berkeley, I think from the clinics and all, I learned a lot. Uh, and I will also say that a lot of our ignorance about the violence in our society, about wrongs in our society, also happens from our own ignorance. So when I was in Berkeley, I remember uh, we were doing some work on India-centric torture, and uh, somebody from the uh, student group said that, uh, well, you're only talking about sexual violence in terms of women. Why are you not? Why are you not making it gender neutral? And I said, no, no, no. Sexual violence only happens against women. But that was my ignorance because as I started working, I realized that every case of police torture where I knew the Vic person uh, was a man. There was high amount of sexual assault involved. The techniques very much the torture techniques in our police force, which go back again to Britain, colonial times, 
have an element of uh, sexual assault in them. And uh, and that was my ignorance and I looked the other way and we are a patriarchal society. So even today, most of those people do not want to discuss the sexual assault because it's very difficult for them to take a, uh, discuss that sexual assault. So that kind of work also brings with it, with it its own trauma. It's not romantic work. It's not that, you know, I go to court and cases, you know, and the decision change and my client wins and I'm the hero. No, that's not how it happens. It is a very difficult space to survive. Uh, like I said, somebody like Sudha and many of our loved ones are in jail today. Um, I and I think the point where I realized that I can't work with the court system any longer was actually this this particular case that really broke my heart. I was representing uh, a man who was 102 years old. His son was murdered by the police when he was uh, 23. Um, and uh, what the police had done was he and this man was the main primary witness to his abduction, but also to the fact that he was last time in police custody. And these cases were finally opened by the Supreme Court in like there were a bunch of cases like that from Punjab, about 2500 of them. And they were finally opened by the Supreme Court after like a lot went down, a, a major human rights defender was disappeared and stuff. So finally, the Supreme Court looked into it and they opened up for investigation into 25 cases. In 96, the case was opened up for investigation. The police says, hey, we enjoy sanction. So you can't like, you know, you can't prosecute us. The lower court said, no, you don't enjoy sanction for doing illegal killings. That wasn't your job. You killed an innocent person. That's the allegation. The high court also said the same thing. But the case was pending for 13 years in the Supreme Court. And at that point of time, uh, you know, I was approached when, and they said, this man's 102. If he passes away, we don't have, the main testimony. We really need to get his testimony recorded. Um, and we went to the court. We filed an urgent application that's saying that, you know, you decide the case, you don't decide the case, but at least get his testimony recorded because he's the last surviving witness. Um, and somehow we were very lucky that the judge we got that day was Justice Gorda. And uh, I will say that Justice Gorda has been one of the most socially justice conscious judges that we've seen in the last decade or so. And and he was astounded why this case is still in the court. He couldn't understand. So he was just like, I'm not giving an adjournment. We were surprised that, you know, the case got decided that day. We were very happy. And he said no sanction required cases to proceed, trials to proceed 13 years later. And the man passes away a week before the trial starts. And it was very heartbreaking. And I think at that point of time, I realized that law is not the center of the work that I do. The community that I work with has to be the center of the work that I do. And law is just one of the tools. They have to be other tools also. Um, and it was in that, uh, it was because of that, that I started, uh, that I sort of uh, took on the kind of movement lawyering that I do. And I think it's in that lens that today I'm also going for my PhD research to kind of also look into where is the accountability conversation lacking and how we can move here. Uh, and uh, if students want to learn, um, I think I'm sort of above my time now. Uh, so I will sort of end on that note. I will read uh, a little bit from this like series that I really like a lot. It's called Orange is the New Black, which I will encourage all of you to watch. It's on Netflix, uh, which is about uh, women in incarceration in US prisons. It talks about racism. It talks about, uh, you know, sexual assault against women in prisons. Um, and he says how to do life. We create rules to guide our behavior so we can live peacefully around other people. But sometimes our lives press up against the rules. The rules seem arbitrary and confining. Sometimes we come to a place of conflict between our inner emotions, reality, and society and what society demands of us. We act in ways that damage us or other people in their or their property. Crime is a breaking point. Sometimes we're on one side of it as a victim. Sometimes we're on the other side as offender. Justice is about repairing that break. And I think that that is the responsibility when we enter law school, because justice at the end, we are all in the pursuit of justice when we enter law school. And I think if you're in the pursuit of that justice, it is important for us to understand how to repair that break, to understand how we heal ourselves as a society, how we put an end to that violent cycle 
and what we can do, even when we are not doing movement lawyering or human rights lawyering, to be mindful of what our actions or our decisions or our legal reasoning can have on people who are less privileged, who are way more marginalized than us. Uh, and also inculcate that in the five years or two years that you have in law school, in your relationships with your classmate. Um, and, you know, when you when you come to law school, there are a lot of structures. Uh, when I came first came to law school, you were supposed to call all your senior sirs and ma'ams. Uh, and I do think that it's it's a duty to question structures and certain structures are neat. They are arbitrary. They are discriminatory. They need to be questioned. And I'm, I mean, as much as I've learned from my seniors like Shashank, uh, Adash Vargis, Agni Bansar, uh, pa Pallav Mungia, from my classmates like Garima Mitra, uh, Anubhuti Mishra, I've also learned a lot from my juniors. Uh, we and some of them who've come to college after I've passed out. There is a young man called Akshay Mankar who started the Raipur Pride, who started conversations about queer rights in H and L U. Uh, and I don't think at my time somebody could ever have a conversation about queer rights. So there's a lot to learn there. Uh, there are students like Shivangi who started the Constitution Rights Society. Uh, uh, I recently wrote a paper with somebody who passed out of HNLU five years after me. So she I, she wasn't even there when I was in college. And I, I wrote to her and I said, hey, you do a lot of academic papers. Uh, can you, and I haven't done a lot, you know, because I've been working and I want to move back to academia. Can you write a paper for me? And I learned so much from her and we presented a wonderful paper uh, where we questioned international law and its European basis, but also the sort of Brahminical basis in the critiques of international law. And uh, and so it, it you know you need humility to learn. So don't uh, you know be humble, have kindness in how you treat your classmates, and realize the privilege you have in terms of being in an educational institution that allows you to know the power of law. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. The session has truly moved me. There is so much to learn from your journey and your contribution to the society is really motivating. The career path you chose in life, I believe shaped up from your experiences has given you more strength to take on this difficult path. I hope more such students get inspired. And now I, I will call upon a student student coordinator for the session, Ms. Masuma Rizvi for taking up the questions of the students to our guest speaker. Over to you, Masuma. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the inspiring uh, session, ma'am. Uh, before we move, one question that I have for you is how do you keep faith and how do you keep persevering in, in the face of every injustice that you witness when you work so closely with the system? And how do you, uh, when you see lawyers like Sudha Barjawaj who are incarcerated, how do you keep going on? Uh, I think communities who survive violence, movements that have survived, uh, and lawyers like Sudha Bharadwaj teach you that. That the whole purpose of you know my lecture was don't become cynical about law, be critical, but having faith, having faith that you can change, you can use this power, this knowledge to change. You may not see it. You know, there's a Tom Morello song which, which says the road that I have taken, it's end I may not see. But you need to believe the first road towards changing something is to believe it will happen. And you have to believe at the core of your heart. And I think that kind of belief only comes when you have humility, when you have kindness in your understanding of law, in your understanding of structures, in your understanding of structures. So I do think that uh, that belief, and they, and I mean, there are also other ways. It's it's also that I'm very lucky to have a community of social justice lawyers who will check on you when something happens who will you know come to your home and be like hey i know it's a difficult time so i'll just stay with you for a few days so uh, we uh, you know i know you're going through something do you want to talk about it so we have i think we, we've also in cause lawyering we've started talking about mental health impacts we've started talking about how to process vicarious if you're documenting death after death you're going to have docu uh, vicarious trauma so how do we navigate vicarious trauma it's okay to take some time off 
uh, you know, so stuff like that. I think we are inculcating those practices. Uh, and but the belief itself is very important and it's important to not let go of that belief. The change will happen. Thank you, ma'am. That makes a lot of sense. My lastly, I would like to ask for your advice for any uh, law students who are looking to move into this space that you work in into movement lawyering etc what would your advice be for them and also a sort of a broad roadmap of things that they could uh, follow i think that uh, everybody has a different role uh, there are people who work in the court systems who are very very important uh, there are people who uh, work in you know who work as human rights specialists as in-house counsels in companies who are also important uh, there are people who are working in the UN who are very important. There are people who are doing academic research into this space who are very important. So uh, you need to see where your uh, strength lies. You need to see where, uh, you know, what is that where you can contribute in terms of the cause. And then once you know where your strength lies, the path itself opens up for you. You know, there are organizations and I'm very happy if somebody uh, I'm ready to share my email ID. So if somebody ever needs to reach out, uh, as some of my juniors know in college, I'm always very accessible. Uh, so you just uh, first understand, you know, and take take one or two years, do different kinds of internships, work with a professor, uh, work with a senior lawyer, work with uh, work with an NGO, work with a grassroots group, work with a movement, work clerk with a judge. Uh, I think I understood Salwa Jadum because I was clerking with Justice Nijar at that point of time. Um, and uh, and from there, understand where you think your strength lies and you can contribute. Right, ma'am. Thank you for your time. Over Thank to you. you, sir. Thank you, Masuma, for the questions and thank you, Guneet, ma'am for taking them so graciously and answering them with such great detail. It was indeed an enriching and enlightening session and it has truly moved me. It has motivated me and all everyone who has attended the lecture that there is a higher purpose to life that is to serve the society and reading law, we can do that. Moving on now, I would like to request our respected registrar, Professor Dr. Uday Shankar, sir, for giving the concluding remarks. Over to you, sir. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Professor Arindam, and uh, thanks to uh, Guneet for uh, uh, taking all of us on the journey which uh, law school inspires and uh, law school, in a way, motivates. I would say not only to the student, but also to everyone who is associated, be faculty or the you know the staff. Uh, I recall uh, those days of my HNLU when Guneet was a student, and uh, I vividly remember that I saw an entry in the register, uh, which was kept in the library, and I saw a jurisprudence book issued by a student, uh, authored by Bonneman. And I just wondered that who has issued this book? I mean, first year student reading a book on jurisprudence. And then when I looked at the name, it was Guneet Kaur. And uh, I, I believe that after that, if I if my memory serves me correctly, I had a talk with her and I said that, what made you to issue this book? Because I mean, jurisprudence as such appears to be a very scary subject. And that too, when you pick it up in the very first year, first semester, uh, it really gives a different kind of uh, message altogether. Uh, then she said to me, yeah, sir, I have got an interest and I'm just trying to learn. And uh, I must say, uh, the, the, the beginning was there and uh, your journey from uh, 2008 to 2021 truly reflects the, the learning what uh, you have got, not only from the HNLU, but from the social ambience, what HNLU has presented to you. Uh, and, and, and that's how I recall that when we uh, start like, you know, taking a session on constitutional law, we always say 
that the constitution is not only a legal document, it is also a political document and a social document. And the, the, the main reason of saying so is to just to make the student aware and informed that why the law and the constitution in particular is an organic document because it promises the meaningful, dignified way of leading a life to the last person who is standing in the queue. And I, I must uh, express my gratitude to the Honorable Vice Chancellor for conceiving such a wonderful orientation program of inviting all of you and giving a kind of uh, platform to the freshers to get the different perspective altogether. That as a law student, you need to really enjoy your learning and enjoy in such a way so that you do not commit only to lead a good life as an individual, but also you are committed towards others and you are a true uh, example for the same. So it is really glad to hear you. Uh, good to see you after a long time, though it's in a virtual mode. And as uh, Sir has said that we really look forward to host you at the university uh, and, and engage into discussion, debate, and to see that how law can truly reform. Uh, I personally believe that law is not the only tool to bring in reform. It is one of the tools. Uh, and then your journey can very well, uh, you know, be a sort of testament for the same that how the law student they need to really imbibe the values which the law expects. Uh, so thank you for uh, accepting our invite. Thank you for sparing time and good luck for your PhD program, which you are. You have said to us, you have informed us that you are going to pursue in this year or in year to come. So good luck for the same. Uh, I, on behalf of uh, HNLU family, on behalf of the coordinator, express my uh, sincere uh, gratitude to you for agreeing to uh, speak to our new students. Thank you very much, Kunil. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, a big thank you to our guest speaker. Ms. Guneet Kaur for giving us her valuable time from her busy schedule and taking this session. I hope ma'am we'll see you again taking a session in the campus when the pandemic passes and we were really moved by your experiences and you're really motivated. It has given us a higher purpose in life. Thank you so much ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So with the permission of the chair, I call this session as closed. Thank you everyone. Also, also, I would like to extend my thanks and gratitude to honorable vice chancellor, sir, respected registrar, sir, the digital team, Jeevan, sir, Ankit, sir, Atul, sir, and everyone who has helped make this event a success. Thank you everyone.